Tonight we're going to be looking at, hopefully, Psalms 90, 91, and 92. I know for sure I'm going to take you through Psalm 90. And I hope to take you through up to Psalm 92, but let's see what happens tonight. Beginning at verse 1, Psalm 90. The psalmist says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood, they are like a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which grows up, in the morning it flourishes and grows up, in the evening it is cut down and withers. For we've been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath, we finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are seventy years, and if by reason of strength they are eighty years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. O satisfy us early with your mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us and the years in which we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. There are 150 psalms, the majority of them being written by King David. David wrote, wrote and by, by autograph uh, in the, in the uh, Old Testament. We know that 73 times you'll see him say a psalm of David. And then two of the psalms uh, are recognized in the uh, New Testament and are attributed to David. So 75 of the 150 psalms were written by David. Then there are a variety of other writers, as we've been seeing, the sons of Korah and, and, and Asaph and various other writers this particular psalm here, Psalm 90, is a psalm written by Moses. This is the only psalm in the entire uh, Old Testament that is written by, by Moses, who is also known as Moses, the servant of God. And this particular psalm is uh, a psalm that he writes that really relates to the time that the children of Israel was in their wilderness experience. So this is the only psalm that is attributed to Moses, and it speaks concerning the sorrow and I want you to think about this. It speaks concerning the sorrow that Moses went through as he watched an entire generation of people die in the wilderness. You see, when, when Moses was leading the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, God first took Moses to a place called Mount Sinai. And that's where God first gave the uh, nation of Israel the, uh, the law and also began to prepare them to enter into what is called the promised land. But while they were there journeying in the wilderness, while they were there on their way to the promised land, the nation of Israel rebelled against God. And because the nation rebelled against God, the entire generation that had left Egypt from 20 years age and of age and above perished in the wilderness. The Bible in the Old Testament book of Numbers in chapter 32 verse 13 says, the Lord's anger was roused against Israel. He made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. And when you think about that, you need to remember the amount of people that had left Egypt on their way to the Promised Land, and conservative scholars estimate that there was no less than two million people who had left that, uh, that Egyptian bondage in order to make it to the Promised Land. So it's possible that Moses was, was the witness of, of up to two million people dying. Now, can you imagine that? So as he writes this particular psalm, it's with that in mind. It's a psalm of sorrow. It's a psalm of recognition that the Lord has, uh, has brought an entire generation to a place of judgment while in the wilderness. Now, Martin Luther wrote about this psalm in this way. Martin, Martin Luther said this. He said, just as Moses acts in teaching the law, so does he in this psalm. For he preaches death, sin, and condemnation in order that he may alarm the proud who are secure in their sins, 
and that he may set before their eyes their sin and evil. And so Psalm 90 is a psalm that speaks concerning what occurred and how Moses is writing during that time. So beginning at verse 1, verses 1 and 2, Moses writes, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So Moses begins here in Psalm 90 by praising God because God is the creator and God is the ruler of the entire universe. God is the oasis of his people. He's there in order to protect them. He's there in order that he might provide for them. And that's what he's speaking about here. He's the creator of the earth. He's the eternal one who is always there for his people. He is the one who, even as he says in the second portion of verse 2, he is the one who is from everlasting to everlasting, unchanging, and always God. Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27 says this, Of old you laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. Uh, your hands, like a cloak, you will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And he goes on in verse 3 to say, but as far as man is concerned, you turn man to destruction. That word destruction in the Hebrew can also be translated dust. And it speaks concerning man's finitude or his, his, his uh, transience. He says, you, you turn man to destruction and say, return, O children of men. Why? Well, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it's passed, like a watch in the night. You carry them like a flood, they're like, sh like sleep. In the morning, they're like grass which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes and grows up. In the evening, it is cut down and it withers. So what he's doing here very simply is comparing our short lifespan with God's eternity. He's simply saying man has a limited amount of time on earth and ultimately returns to the dust. But unto you, Lord, a thousand years is like a moment that comes and passes by. That's why James in chapter 4 verse 14 would ask the question, what is your life? And then he answers it. It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You are here for a moment and then you're gone. That's the point that the scripture tells us. Therefore, we need to number our days. A vapor. That's what our life consists of. That's what the Bible speaks about. That's the length of our days. It's like on a cold winter morning when you get up early to come to church on Sunday so that you might come to first service. And you get up and you turn on the hot shower and you step out of the room for a moment while the water warms up. Then you come back into the bathroom and the mirror has been fogged. That's our life because it doesn't take any time at all for that mist that has formed over the mirror to dissipate. It's there right now, but all you have to do is get a hairdryer and just blow a little spot and it just evaporates and it's gone. And that's the point. And he's saying, God, in comparison to you, we are dust. In comparison to you, even if we were to live a thousand years, like Methuselah who lived 969 years, that's a long time, but that's a moment to you. It's like the grass in the morning. You go out and you, you have some new grass that's coming up, but in reality that new grass can be burned with a withering heat and it can die in the same day. Well, even so, that's our lifespan. Compared to God who is eternal, we are but a moment. In verse 7, for we have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath, we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength, they are 80 years. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off, we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Our life is brief, and it's brief in part because of your anger towards sin. And he says to us that God sees man's sins. God sees our iniquities, and he also sees, this is interesting, he also sees our secret sins. And that's interesting because iniquities are obvious sins. They're acts of wickedness. And so not only does God see my iniquities, the things that I do that are wrong, but so can you, so can human beings. A person can live in such a way 
that their lifestyle is quite obvious. You see a guy stumbling down the street. He's got a, you know, a brown bag, and he thinks nobody knows what's inside of it. And he's walking down the street with that, and he's drinking it. And his iniquity is quite obvious. It's obvious that the man is an alcoholic. It's obvious that this is the lifestyle that he's chosen. And so you can find some sins that are very obvious, and they're so obvious that other people can recognize them. And so that's an iniquity. That's a wickedness. But, you know, there are some, and I, I, I know of some, who are alcoholic. But they go to work. They are able to carry on with their job from 8 to 5. They do their work that day. They're good workers, hard workers, diligent workers. Then they drive home. Then they hit the bottle all afternoon into the night, pass out drunk at night. The next morning they wake up sober, go to work again, and that's a secret sin. That's something that nobody even knows they have. And they can do that for a long time. People can come to church, and we know that. And they can walk into a church building with their Bible, their 300-pound cross on their chest. And they can walk in, and they, and, they, and they know when to say hallelujah. They know when to say praise the Lord. They know when to stand up and raise their hands. They know how to do all of that. And they do it well. And a lot of people look at them and say, man, that person really loves Jesus Christ. But they go home, and they're an entirely different person. That's true, too. It's called hypocrisy. But that's a secret sin. They have secret sins that they think that nobody knows they're doing, and perhaps it may be true. They may go home, and the wife may go out of the house for a while, and they open up their, their, their uh, computer, and bang, they're on that page, and they're looking at the things they know they ought not to be looking at. But they can tell when someone's coming in. Sometimes they even have some little, uh, you know, little signals. You know, they have bells here or they have something there that goes off. And they know when somebody's coming in. They know that. And they can shut everything down. And they're into, into porn, internet porn. But even their wife doesn't even know that. Because it's a secret sin. Well, what is he saying here? He's saying in verse 8, You have set our iniquities before you. You see the open ones our secret sins in the light of your countenance. Everything is open before you. Romans chapter 2, verse 16 puts it this way. God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Paul in 1 Corinthians in chapter 4, verse 5 said, The Lord will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Hebrews 4, 13 says, There's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And so ultimately, because God sees all things, ultimately we have an account to give and we give our account to him. And so the point he's making is quite obvious. The Lord sees all things. And so if that's true, verse 12 is very important, of course, when he says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You know, because our days, like he said in verse 9, have passed away in your wrath, it's very important for us to understand that our life will be marked by brevity and very often is marked by sorrow. And finally, we'll even close our life off, like he says in verse 9, uh, we can finish our years like a sigh. Um, which is another way of simply saying that most people don't enter into eternity with a lot of bravado. It's one thing, in other words, to be healthy. It's one thing right now to be strong and to have a lot of years before you. And a lot of people are that way, of course. I mean, we have all these people who go and work out and their bodies are fit and strong, their heart's in good condition, they're taking care of their weight and everything, and, and all of that can be a good thing, you know, and yet they're not taking care of their eternity. And they may have this strong and healthy, you know, uh, life that goes on for many years. And sometimes, as my, you know, I'm growing older now, I, I, I've heard these kinds of things now over the years where, where people, you know, really do think they're going to they're gonna live a lot longer than they ultimately do. And, it, and it's age, age creeps up on you. You don't even realize that you've grown old until you one day look in the mirror and you say, who's that old man looking at me? And it turns out it's, it's you. You start growing older and you begin to realize that, you know, you jump out of bed and you hit the ground and then you really hit the ground. I mean, you can't keep yourself up. And you spend a lot more time at that old makeup mirror. And, and that's what happens. 
you know, that hourglass shape, you know, the sand ships to the bottom, and, and that's, the way, that's the way it is. And so we begin to number our days. We begin to be aware of the fact that we don't have that many days allotted to us. Uh, I, at, the, at the risk of sounding um, morose, which I don't want to, I don't want to give the wrong impression. It's, frankly, I really don't. But it, it's true. I was talking to my wife, Marie, the other day, and uh, there's this old song by this old group, uh, ancient group called the Beatles. I don't know if any of you ever, ever heard of them. Um, but uh, there's one line in one of their songs that speaks about the road ahead is shorter than the road behind. And I understand that. I've lived 54 years. There's no way that I'm middle-aged. You know, I see guys my age saying, I'm middle-aged. So you've got to be kidding. If you're going to live to be 108, you're middle-aged. What you are is you're half dead. You just have to start admitting it, you know. I mean, you are going to die real soon. But anyway, I was talking to Marie the other day about that. And I said, you know, honey, I said, my papa lived to be 74. The oldest uncle I have on the Rosales side lived to be 78. I said, as far as I see, unless the Lord is going to do something different with me, I've got 24 years, maybe, maybe 24 years. I have to live those days for the Lord. And I was speaking to Marie about that. She doesn't want to hear it, but it's true. I'm 54 years old. You know, if I live to be 78, I live as long as the oldest uncle I've ever had. They just don't live that long. I said, and so I am numbering my days. I'm aware of the fact that each day I have is the last one that I have. I'll never be able to go back and repeat the things that I, that I would like to. I'll never go back because all I can do now is go forward, and that's just the way it is. Am I down about that? Absolutely not. One day more is one day closer to Jesus Christ. One day closer to being with Him. No, I'm not bummed about it. It's just a fact. So I'm asking the Lord to help me to number my days, to be aware of the fact that I don't have as many in front of me as I one time thought that I might have. I might, like the psalmist said, live 70 years and by way of strength, maybe 80. And so the bottom line is we need to learn to number our days. And in doing so, we will actually gain a heart of wisdom. In other words, may we use the days that are allotted to us wisely for the sake of the kingdom of God, for the sake of eternity. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17 put it this way. We are to be redeeming the time. Why? Well, the days are evil. Therefore, he says, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Redeeming the time, using every day, buying each day back and using it for Jesus' sake. Please, don't get caught up thinking that you have a long time before you, that you can mature slowly in the things of the Lord, and then eventually you can lead your friends to Christ. As you're young, the best thing you can do is talk to your friends about the Lord, and the best thing you can do is live for the Lord in front of them. Live for the Lord in front of your friends and encourage them to know Jesus Christ. Listen, because sometimes when you're 14, 15, 17 years old, sometimes you think, oh, you know what, I've got plenty of time. They're, you know, I don't want to come on too heavy with them and all of that. And anyway, I'm still struggling with my own walk and my own faith, and that may be true because we have to work out our own salvation, and, and we do grow, and our testimony does have to, uh, have to grow along with us. And yet the bottom line is, is you're losing opportunities that you'll never gain back if you don't take them when they're handed to you. You need to redeem the time. You need to number your days. Verse 13, return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. O satisfy, satisfy us early with your mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you've afflicted us and the years in which we have seen evil. Let your, servant, uh, let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. God, turn our sorrow into joy. Lord, have compassion and have mercy on us. Cause us to once again rejoice and, and may your joy become our strength until the day that we go home to be with you. And, and Lord, instead of wrath, may we once again experience your mercy. We need to remember that daily Moses was seeing people die. Every day, people were dying around him. Every day, there was a funeral service. And in the midst of all this sorrow, he's crying out to the Lord that God may renew his mercy to the nation. 
Because as he's burying people, as he's there seeing people die every day, and you have to think about that for a moment, the millions of people, the two million people and those so many hundreds of thousands, million people dying around him, a generation dying around him. Think about it for a minute. Every day, multiple funerals. Every day, people dying, not reaching the promised land. And that sobers you up. That sobers you up. That causes you to realize that, that life is fleeting at best. The writer Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2 said it this way. He said, It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. What are you saying, Solomon? I'm saying this way. I'm saying it's, it's fun to go to a party and you have enjoyable time and you laugh with each other and all of that, but you get sobered up at a funeral. You get sobered up at a funeral. You go to a party and you laugh with your friends. You don't learn anything there normally, but you do learn things at a funeral. I promise you that you do. I've shared this before, and I'll share it at this time. Many years ago now, it's been a number of years ago now, I got a phone call. I was asked to do a funeral for a 17-year-old girl. And I've told you this story. Some of you have heard it before. She didn't go to our fellowship. I was asked to do the funeral young lady who had gotten in a fight with her boyfriend. The boyfriend was angry and drove away, and as sometimes happens, the little girl wasn't through with the argument, decided to hunt him down, got into her car, and began to chase him down the road. She was driving over here on Riverside Drive, and she was speeding to try and catch him. So she began to pass cars, and as she began to pass cars, she ran head on into a car coming the opposite direction with a young mother and her two babies, and all of them died. And I was asked to please do the funeral of this little girl, 17. And I remember going to do the funeral, and as I was standing, all of these high school kids are inside the funeral home. And I can still remember looking into the back, and it wasn't that large a funeral home, filled with these kids. And I remember looking into the back. And as I looked into the back there, there were several little girls, I call them little girls, they were teenagers, they were in their late teens, but they were laughing. And I had prepared statement, I was doing the funeral, and, and I remember looking back there and seeing them kind of laughing and giggling, and I remember just sliding my notes underneath my Bible, and then looking in their direction, and beginning to share with them from my heart. Kind of what I'm sharing with you guys, the kind of thing I'm sharing with you right now. How many of you think that you have tomorrow promised to you? Why, because you're 17? because your life is in front of you, you got plenty of time. How do you know that? She thought she had more time too, and she didn't make it, did she? What makes you think that you're gonna make it just because somebody else lived to be 30 doesn't guarantee that you will? Are you prepared? And I spoke to their hearts, and you should have seen the sobriety that took place in that place, because the kids stopped giggling and stopped moving around, and, and I said, you got a casket in front of here with your friend, right here, with your friend. She's dead, and you're gonna die too. And you know, it's one of those straight talks that need to take place. You get sober-minded in a funeral. You get sober-minded. Teach us to number our days. Help us to realize that it's like a vapor. Help us to realize like it's like grass that grew up today and is burned tonight. Help us to understand this so that we might live with wisdom and fear of you, Lord. We need to understand that. And that's basically what he's saying here. Moses saw death every day because of rebellion. So he's crying out to God, and he's saying, God, be merciful to the nation. God, renew your compassion to this nation. God, I'm asking you, show us your goodness. That's a wise thing to ask for, especially in light of the fact that he went through as much as he did. Now, Psalm 91. This is an upbeat psalm. I think you'll appreciate it. It's a great one. Beginning in verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. 
A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, even as Psalm 90 is a psalm of sorrow, the sorrow of seeing millions die, Psalm 91 actually celebrates life. This is a psalm, it's an anonymous psalm, it's a psalm that reveals a place of protection and security that God gives to those who fear Him. Notice in verses 1 and 2 how He says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide, shall abide, He says, under the shadow of the Almighty. So the psalmist is revealing that those who trust in the Lord are, are one, are loved by Him, and two, are secure in Him. That's because the believer dwells or abides in the shadow and shelter of God who is their fortress. That gives us a picture of security because we abide in security in Him. We rest in the Lord and we completely trust in Him because God says that He will protect us. In Psalm 32, verse 7, the psalmist said, You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of Deliverance, and so he begins out with that, begins with a with a with a praise to God because we have our security, and we can say to him in verse two that he is my refuge, and verse three continuing, he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. He says, surely he shall deliver you, and from the perilous pestilence. This is another promise of of divine protection. He gives us a picture here of of a bird. We can say a mother hen. When he says, under his wings you shall take refuge, in verse 4, as a, a mother hen that puts her, her wings over her, her babies to protect them, that's the picture of the Lord. We're dwelling in Him, secure as is possible, being protected by Him. And that which keeps us is the Lord, but also truth. He speaks of truth being a shield that protects you from the attacks of the enemy. Satan uses lies, and God sets you free with truth. That's why Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And so God's truth protects us like a, a shield and a buckler. A buckler is a small shield, and it's a way of protecting us from the attacks of the enemy. When he said in verse 7, a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, it shall not come near you, only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Uh, we're going to keep our eyes on the Lord, is the point he's making, even when terror surrounds us. And ultimately, we see the end of the wicked, and we can compare it with how good God has been treating us. In verse 9, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high your habitation, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And they shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. It's interesting to note here, but the Lord has placed angels in a position of protection for those who fear Him. This is one of those scriptures that people uh, receive an understanding of what is commonly called a guardian angel. The angels of the Lord protect us. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, the writer said that angels are ministering spirits who are sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. And so the point he's making is that God protects us as we live and follow Him. And we realize that we encounter many things as we follow Him, some of those things being very terrible, and yet God is there with us. Just because I'm a believer, in other words, doesn't mean that my life will be exempt from pain. We all know that by experience, don't we? Just because I gave my heart to Jesus doesn't mean that, that from that moment on everything was just absolutely, you know, without pain or sorrow. That's just not true whatsoever. Uh, all you need to do is read your Bible. Look at the man Job. When you look at the first chapter of the book of Job, you see that God actually makes a, a, a statement concerning him that he's a righteous man and hates evil and goes on to say that there's nobody like him on the face of the earth. 
Job was a very righteous man, somebody that God had taken notice of. But not only had God taken notice of Job, but so had Satan. And on the day when the angels of the Lord, including Satan, assembled to give an account of their goings forth and all, you know, the Bible tells us that, that, that Satan was there amongst the other angels. And, and, and when you read and study through Job, you note that God speaks to Satan and he says, where have you been? And when God speaks to Satan and asks him, where have you been? God is placing him in a position of being interrogated. And when you study that, you can see that in, in the original language, what it really is saying is very simply this. God is saying, I know you've been up to no good, and you now have to give an account of what you've been up to. And so Satan tells him, I've been going throughout the earth back and forth. You know, in other words, what I've been doing is like a roaring lion seeking whom I may devour. And that's why God says, have you considered my servant Job? When he says, have you considered, have you looked at him, have you investigated him, have you looked closely to find something about him that you can bring an accusation before me about? I know that you've been doing this, so tell me. He says, well, of course I have. Of course I've looked at Job. But you put a hedge about him, and there's no way I can get to him. And that's when Satan begins to speak concerning the fact, take his wealth and take his health from him, and he'll curse you to your face. But look at the life of Job. And as you read through the book of Job, you see that he goes through one thing after another, pain after pain after pain after pain, and yet he was a righteous man. There's no guarantee in Scripture that after you get saved and walk with God that you'll never have a bad day. It just doesn't happen. Or look at the life of Jesus, our, our Messiah, who went through great pain and great, 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 great suffering on our behalf. A perfect man, of course, he's God in the flesh. And so sometimes we may get the idea that if you get saved, you're going to have a, every day a great day. Well, sometimes those days are pretty tough. At least I've discovered that they are. But one of the things that I've discovered is God's mercies are renewed every morning. And so I woke up the next day saying, God, renew me today. I remember when my children were young, I would say to them, well, it's especially when the day didn't end so good on, for them, you know, I'd say, you know, the good thing about all of this is tomorrow's a new day. And tomorrow we can start over again. Tomorrow's a new day, and we can start over again tomorrow. I've always had that kind of attitude with my kids. Let's start out right tomorrow. Today didn't end the way we wanted it to, but we can start out tomorrow better. God is good, and he gives us renewed opportunities, you see. But you know what? Sometimes the days that you go through are very tough, but God is saying, I'll be with you through all of those things. I'll be there with you through them all. So God takes care of us no matter what. We know that no power is out of God's control. And that's why I can trust him in all things. And that's why Romans 8, 28 is a powerful verse. We know that, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to, the, to those who are the called according to his purpose. We know that some of the ingredients of our life may not make sense when we're looking at them. It's like when you make sweet and sour sauce. And you put sugar here, and you put, you put lemon there, and vinegar here. How does that work together? But somehow it does. And when you do it right, it tastes very good. When you don't do it right, throw it away. But when you do it right, it tastes very good. Well, our lives are that way. And God takes care of us. He says in verse 14, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. They ultimately will be with me in heaven. No matter what dangers they may go through, I deliver the one who trusts in me. Now, I wouldn't do you uh, uh, right if I didn't point this out, which I should do. I want you to notice verse 11. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against a stone. You recognize that scripture, don't you? Now, where is that scripture found? Well, in the temptation of Jesus. When Jesus Christ is being tempted by Satan, you remember how Satan took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple? And he said, throw yourself down, for it is written... He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and they shall lift thee up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Do you remember that? That's an exact quote. Do you remember that? Well, I want you to see what the scripture actually says, because remember with me that Jesus said, you are not to tempt the Lord thy God. Now, why would Jesus say that? Keep this in mind. It's very practical and very basic. Satan knows scripture and quotes it too. 
Jesus had already said to the enemy in his series of temptations, it is written. And when Jesus had quoted scripture using it as the sword of the spirit, Satan said, two can work that game. If you want to quote scripture, I will quote it also. It is written. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and they shall lift thee up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. He took that out of Psalm 91, and he also took that out of context. Because in verse 11 it says, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. He eliminated that phrase. Because when you're walking in the ways of God, you don't presume on God. You don't test the Lord thy God. Jesus never presumed on God. He knew he had an appointed time. And so what the, the enemy is trying to do by using the scripture is to tempt Jesus to presume on God. Knowing, Jesus knowing that his, his, uh, his orders were to follow the will of God to the cross. Now, Malachi had said that uh, the messenger whom Israel seeks shall suddenly come to his temple. And so, naturally, what is faster, or coming suddenly to the temple, what is faster than the speed of gravity plummeting from the pinnacle, being held up by angels, and being presented as Messiah, fulfilling the Scripture? But Jesus said, no, that's not the way it's supposed to be. I'm not going to presume on God. See, in other words, it's kind of like this in the practical way. I believe that you are indestructible until the moment God has appointed for you to go home. Now, that doesn't mean go out and run headlong into traffic on the freeway to see how indestructible you are because he might just, you know, bring you home a little earlier. It doesn't work that way. You're not to tempt the Lord your God, but you do have an appointed time. And so in this particular case, this scripture here is being spoken of in a way to keep us as the righteous or those who are following the Lord in the ways of God, and he will protect us. And then by way of application, it was used against Jesus by the enemy. But God's promise is no matter what the danger may be, God delivers you. Because ultimately, we shall be with him in heaven. That's why Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go and prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. And he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so the Lord is with us every step of the way, and ultimately he delivers us and he honors us. And then finally, Psalm 92. We're actually going to be able to do that psalm too. Beginning at verse 1. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. On an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp, with harmonious sound, for you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. O Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. But you, Lord, are on high forevermore. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eyes also have seen my desire on my enemies. My ears hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. This has been called a Sabbath song. It's a song of praise and worship. It's a song of adoration because that's what worshiping the Lord on Shabbat or the Sabbath was meant to be. In the first four verses, he says it's good to give thanks to the Lord and sing praises to him. So if you want to do something that's good and if you want to do something that God calls good, well, you worship him. You sing to him. You can do that with musical instruments and you can do that with your voice. And some of us should learn how to play musical instruments because we don't do it very well with our voice. He says in verse 4 that we can rejoice because of his work, and we rejoice especially because of the work of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we give praise to him for that. Psalm 96 verses 1 and 2 says, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth, sing to the Lord and bless his name, proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. 
verse 5, when he says, O Lord, how great are your works, your thoughts are very deep. Then he goes on to say, a senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. Well, bottom line is God's work of deliverance is beyond finding out without his help. I want you to see this when he says in verse 5, the second portion, your thoughts are very deep. Now look at verse 6, a senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. Very briefly, the Bible says this, and I'm going to make it very, very quick. But it may help some of you here. The Bible says the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither uh, can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural man in Scripture is the man without God's Spirit. The natural man is just an unregenerate individual. The natural man is a person who's just born in the natural way and lives a natural life. But the Bible says the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. So the unregenerate man does not receive. The word receive in the original language does not welcome, doesn't encourage to enter in the things of the Spirit of God. It's a picture of God's Spirit knocking on the door of a man's life. And that natural man hears the knocking. And in a way, it's kind of like he's got a you know, window next to the front door. And very quietly, the natural man goes up to that window and, and looks, pulls the curtain aside a little bit and looks out. And he sees someone knocking at the door. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness to him. So he looks out there and he sees that someone's trying to gain entrance. Someone's knocking, wanting him to open the door. But it makes no sense. Why should I open the door to him when I don't feel like doing that? The picture would be the Spirit of God introducing that man to Jesus Christ. But because he likes to live without God, he's a natural man, he thinks it's foolish. The word foolish there is the Greek word that means moronic or imbecilic. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are moronic to him, imbecilic. They make no sense. So we today have people who are natural who attempt to say that they're, not, it's, that, they're, that they're not senseless. In reality, what I am is an intellectual. And you've heard this before. And, and today, and I, I've heard this when I was in college, I've heard this in conversation where somebody will say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a you know, I, I don't know whether I believe in a God or not. You know, I'm an agnostic. And the word agnostic sounds very intellectual, doesn't it? Agnostic, it's a Greek word. It means without knowledge. The Latin is ignoramus. And you never hear anybody say, I'm an ignoramus. No, it's always an agnostic. I have no knowledge. So we actually glory in that. And that's the whole point. He says it's senseless. Creation cries out and says there's a God. It cries out that there's a God. Every house is built by some man. I mean, you drive through neighborhoods and you know that there was a crew that built that house. Every house is built by some man. He who built all things is God. I mean, everything needs a creator, needs a builder. God is the one who built all things. It, it makes sense to a child. It's when we grow older, get older, we start saying, no, it can't be. It's no way. Now, wait a minute. When you were a child, you believed there was a God. You get older and you were convinced that there's not one. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. You can go to school and study theology until you know Hebrew, Greek, Chaldaic, you can know everything that there needs to be taught to you concerning theology. And you can know so much that you can argue somebody into oblivion with all the knowledge that you have. But if the Holy Spirit does not grip your heart and say, this is true. As the scripture says, let God be true and every man a liar. This is true. This is true. That's called conviction. When the Holy Spirit finally grabs your heart and you say, can't avoid it anymore, can't run anymore, I feel like God's hand is on my chest holding me down, I've been caught by God. The natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God, the foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, for they're spiritually discerned. It takes the Spirit of God to grab, it had to take the Spirit to grab my attention, to tell me the songs that are being sung about Jesus, those songs are called worship songs, and they're true. Jesus really is worth all of that. And that Bible study, that book that we're reading, it really is God's Word. 
and he really will deliver you, and he really does love you. It takes the Holy Spirit to convince us of that, and that's what the work of the Spirit does in our life, and it causes us to understand that. So how great are your works, and your thoughts indeed are very, very deep. In verse 8, but you, Lord, are on high forevermore. Behold your enemies, O Lord, for behold your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. And though some people act as if they're going to live forever, God is the only one who is eternal. And those who have resisted him ultimately are scattered, and ultimately they are judged. Verse 10, but my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eye also has seen my desire on my enemies. My ears hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. In other words, God gives me strength, and God refreshes me, and God honors me. The horn is a symbol of strength. The uh, fresh oil is a picture of refreshment. It is also in the New Testament, as well as the Old, a picture of the Holy Spirit. So God gives me strength, and God refreshes me, and God ultimately honors me as I have served Him. He will say to me one day, well done, my good and faithful servant. He also promises us, if we walk with Him, that we are to see the destruction of the enemies of God. And He's pointing out also that we have a great future to look forward to. Finally, in verses 12 through 15, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. There is no unrighteousness in him. The wicked's prosperity is short-lived. The righteous continue into eternity. It's a picture of grass that withers versus a palm tree or a cedar that, that lasts for many years. And finally, one last thought. When it says in verse 14, they shall still bear fruit in old age, they shall be fresh and flourishing. Uh, for those who are growing a bit older, that's a, that's a nice thing. I like that. I was talking to Chuck one time, Pastor Chuck, and um, I'll never forget what he said to me. Because I said, hey, Chuck, when you were just about 65, you announced at a pastor's conference that you were going to retire. I said, and at this time he was 75. I said, and now 10 years have passed and you haven't retired. Uh, what's going on? And he, he laughs and he says, well, he says at one point when I was nearing my 65th year, I thought, well, 65 is when people normally retire. Maybe I'm supposed to retire. He said, and then it hit me. Every day I live with Jesus is a day more of experience with him that I can give to somebody else. And he said, you know, a pastor doesn't retire. A pastor keeps giving out until he goes home to be with the Lord. And I like that because that's true. But not just for a pastor. That's true for all of us in this room. You are young right now. Should the Lord tarry, you may grow old. But you're not going to wither and you're not going to dry up. You're going to have experience with Jesus that you can give to younger people. And as long as we who are growing older rejoice in the fact that we actually are growing older, as long as we don't try and be like we're 23 years old still, you know, like a lot of people my age do, they want their outside to look 23 still. So they go and they get a chop, chop here and a cut, cut there. But they're still old inside, and they may look good sitting there. But challenge them to a race and watch them lose their wind. And they're old. You know, you can dye your, your hair and you can do all you want, but you're still old. Rather than trying to pretend we're young, why don't we grow old with dignity and rejoice knowing that as we grow older, we still are flourishing and we still are bearing fruit and we are models to the younger people who are looking around saying, can't anybody show me something that's real? Can't anybody here show me something that lasts? And as we grow older and hopefully not you know, cranky and crotchety, you know, oh, y'all are young, you know, you all young punks. I hate all you young punks, you know, your hair like this and all those piercings and tattoos. 
goofy looking punks. Well, they used to say that about me. They used to say that about us. And they said it about my father's generation. My dad had borrowed, uh, anybody ever hear of a zoot suit? I'm sure I have some out here. I know exactly. You probably have one, don't you, SC? <laughs> I know you do. Zoot suit. And, um, you know, but my dad had, he used to borrow a zoot suit to look cool and suave and all of that. But he hated the fact that I didn't wear shoes. And he didn't like my long hair. Then I grow up and I see kids buzzing their hair and it's all bald, you know, the eggheads, you know, these cubes. And I'm saying, be a man, grow your hair long. And so we have different mentalities through our generations, right? If we would only get hold of the fact that we can actually bear fruit in old age and be fresh and flourishing and that God can use us to the day he takes us home and even on your deathbed, you can still be witnessing and sharing the gospel with people like my dad did when he was going home to be with the Lord. Even when you're in that position, you're still bearing fruit until the day you go home to be with Jesus. If we could only understand that, then our lives will really count for something. We rejoice in the Lord. We give thanks to God. Why? Because it's good to give thanks to Him.